Madam Vice President, ladies and gentlemen, I thank the African and Diaspora Young Leaders Forum for making me part of this conversation and for the opportunity to deliver these remarks at the closing plenary in the presence of the U.S. Vice President, the Honorable Kamala Harris, and in this spectacular building, so admired by all Ghanaians and indeed by all Africans, as it was designed by one of the foremost architects of his generation, the globally acclaimed Ghanaian architect, David Ajay. The forum has chosen the most relevant theme of Africa's contemporary situation, a theme which sums up the essence of African aspirations, amplifying voices, building partnerships that work. I've stated it before that it sometimes appears the words Africa and Africans have more resonance outside the continent than inside. When we are home on our continent, it always seems very important to assert that we are Ghanaians, Ivorians, Kenyans, Nigerians, Swazis, Senegalese, Rwandans, South Africans, and Zambians. Then we find ourselves outside the, the, the continent, and then we discover that to the, to the outside world, there are no Ghanaians, there are no Senegalese, and there are no Tanzanians. There are only Africans, and we are all simply Africans. The lesson for me is clear. Our destinies are intricately linked with each other, and we're talking not only about those of us on the continent, but about the Africans in the diaspora as well. You can be an honors graduate from any of the top universities of this country. You can be a second or third generation American, and you can be in a well-paid job. If there's an outbreak of Ebola someplace on the African continent, you are an African. Anyone, everybody in the position of leadership in Africa today, thus has his or her work cut out. The urgent responsibility we face is to make our countries and our continent attractive for our peoples, to see them as places of opportunities. It means we must provide education, quality education and skills training. It means our young people must acquire the skills that run modern economies. The impact of a successful Africa on the image and standing of Africans in the diaspora applies with equal force to the image and standing of her sons and daughters who go by the name African Americans, and indeed all her kith and kin in the Americas and the Caribbean. There's a lot of room for your perspectives and energies back in Africa. History tells us of the positive impact of diaspora communities on the growth and development of countries through increased trade activities, rising investments, and the transfer of skills and knowledge. Take the case of China, for example. With an emigre population of some 60 million, the Chinese diaspora is said to be the 25th largest country in the world, who, according to the Nikkei Asian Review, own assets worth 2.5 trillion United States dollars. When foreign companies in the late 1970s reduced their investments in China, it was the Chinese diaspora that shored up the economy. According to the Washington DC-based Migration Policy Institute, MPI, half of the foreign direct investment, that is some 26 billion United States dollars, that transformed China into a manufacturing powerhouse in the 1990s originated from the Chinese diaspora. That is the rationale of Ghana's initiative of Beyond the Return, 
which is building on the considerable success of the year of return and the renewed enthusiasm around building Africa together. We must work to help change the African narrative, which has been characterized largely by a concentration on disease, hunger, poverty, and illegal mass migration. Let us all remember that the destiny of all black people, no matter where they are in the world, is bound up with Africa. We should never forget that famous admonition of the celebrated Jamaican reggae star Peter Tosh when he said, and I quote, don't care where you come from, as long as you are a black man, you are an African, unquote. We must help make Africa the place for investment, progress, and prosperity, and not from where our youth flee in the hope of accessing the mirage of a better life in Europe, Asia, or the Americas. That is what the Beyond the Return seeks to do, so we can derive maximum dividends from our relations with the diaspora in mutually beneficial cooperation, and as partners for shared growth and development. The second half of the 20th century witnessed a great blow for human progress and freedom when the African peoples, in the wake of Ghana's shining example, liberated themselves from the colonial and imperialist yoke and the racist ideology of apartheid and emerged as free, independent peoples to construct new nations of hope and advancement. The first half of the 21st century should consolidate this development and see the growth of modern, prosperous, technologically advanced nations within a united Africa, which would make a reality of the dream of the 21st century as the African century and bring dignity and respect to black people all over the world. We've done enough talking, and dare I say we've had enough conferences and workshops. We know what we need to do. It is time just to do it. We've run out of excuses for the state of our continent. We have the manpower. We should have the political will. It is time to make Africa work. We have good reason to be proud of who we are and the beautiful continent that is ours with its vibrant cultures. The geographic space covered by Africa makes it the second largest of the seven continents. It has 30 percent of the world's remaining minerals of value. It is some of the most breathtaking scenes on our planet. It has plants and animals that are wonders of the world and critical for the survival of the globe. I hear a lot about the need to change our narrative and tell our own good story. Ladies and gentlemen, as the saying goes, nothing succeeds like success. If we work at it, if we stop being beggars and spend Africa's monies inside the continent, Africa would not need to ask for respect from anyone. We would get the respect we deserve. Over 30 years ago, one of America's most prestigious Ivy League universities offered a course in Mandarin, which for years had virtually no takers. Today, there is standing room only. And it is not because the course is any easier. It is because the position of China has changed. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, China was nowhere near where it is today. China does not ask for any, anyone for respect now. She does not need it. Let us make our continent the prosperous and joyful place it should be, and the respect would follow. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>